Okay, we're going to get started now. Thank you again for joining us for this uh, episode of the Anra Huddle. Always and fascinating conversation. I'm Miriam McNabb and I'm editor at dronelife.com. I'm honored this morning to be moderating this panel of experts on the common operational picture, which is kind of a key element of um, scalable operations. And I'm going to introduce our panel as we go along, but uh, looking at the, at the, uh, Pictures, if you could each just raise your hand as I call your name so people know who we are. Tom Adams, Peter Kalatsidis, Nate Roby, Luke Antoon, and Charles Warner. Thanks very much. Okay, Nate, we're going to start with you. Um, Nate, you have a career that has been in the power industry, using drones in the commercial um, space. You're now with Onra Technologies. Let's start uh, by sort of placing this. What is a common operational picture? You know, what data is relevant? What capabilities are needed? So what and why when we talk about a common operational picture or COP? Yeah, thank you very much, and just like to to thank the folks that have uh, attended, as well as the the panel that we have here. So, just real brief, and in, in in general, you know, we'll get to the subject matter experts after, uh, so that they can really dive deep into it. But what a common operational picture is is just a real time visual depiction of events that are taking place in a specific area. So today, most of the discussion is going to be around uh, airspace, but there's technology available that brings in or fuses data uh, from additional data sources that enhances situational awareness to include other modes of transportation, which would be uh, marine vessels, common road vehicles, uh, or potentially people that are participating with additional communication devices like laptops, uh, cell phones, or tablets. So the goal really at the end of the day for a common operational picture is to provide the active participants with a consistent stream of information that is timely and effective for critical decision making. I think you may be on mute, Marion. Thank you very much. My apologies for that. Um, let's move on to Peter. Peter, you have a career that has spanned from the being in the drone industry with Easy Aerial. You're now at New York Power Authority, where you're really uh, taking a leadership role in using drones in utility work. You're running a large program there. Um, let's talk about why a common operational picture or a system like this is actually helpful when you're talking about being in the field as a utility doing work with drones. Why do you require something like this? Look, we're at a, a, a point in history where, where drones are becoming more and more available. Multi-rotors, fixed wings, heavy lifts, some really interesting use cases are being developed all across the nation. Then we add in manned aviation, helicopter inspections, emergency management, forest fires, police activity. We are getting a congested airspace by having a common operating picture, UTM ish type of thing gives us the ability not to know just where we are in space, but where our comrades are in the aviation industry. It should help us become safer. If Con Ed is flying down a mile away and I'm here and national grids on the other stretch, knowing and understanding where everyone is is a safer avenue and and that's the aviation mindset behind it. Excellent. I want to take a minute here to um, frame our panel a little bit just because we do do have uh, resources from kind of all stakeholders in the copper common operational picture. So we just heard from. Peter, who is a user of drones, commercial user, um, working for a utility. We have Tom, who has a counter UAS perspective, uh, background in Homeland Security. We have Charles Werner, who has the perspective of first responders. Um, he is the head of, of drone responders. 
largest advocacy group of uh, first responders using drones. And we have Luke who comes from the European perspective of use space as an expert in these sort of integrated traffic management systems and use space. And he has the perspective of how the common operating pers uh, picture fits into that whole larger perspective of use space technologies. Native course at ANRA is a working for a technology provider that is facilitating the common operational picture. So this is where we have all of these different um, perspectives. So let's move now um, over to Tom. You know, Tom, you come from a background, Homeland Security and federal agencies. Now you are an expert in the counter UAS um, field. So when it comes to counter UAS operations, how important is the common operational picture? Because we've got, you know, sort of the users and the people flying, but then we have, um, the people responsible for securing airspace and making sure only authorized users are in that airspace. Yeah, so thanks, Miriam. Uh, having one of the most challenging things about uh, performing some sort of an airspace awareness and protection mission or a counter UAS mission is not understanding, is trying to understand what other drone, other crewed or uncrewed aircraft are doing in the airspace, because that's part of your, your threat assessment and it helps to dictate what your response is or is not your response and also it helps to deconflict um you know some potential investigations it's it's not uncommon for crewed aircraft to be mistaken for drones at night um if i'm doing a mission let's say protecting a prison i would want to know that there's a um a drone nearby doing an inspection of of some utilities or some power lines or if there's a public safety mission going on those are the types of things you need to understand and, and getting into the crewed aircraft side when you're, if you have the authorities to do both the detection and mitigation mission, your actions as a counter UAS operator may impact other crewed and uncrewed users of the national airspace. So you have to understand, like if you were to jam a drone, um, that drone could go into its lost link protocol and might end up uh, causing more of an issue than maybe it had before as it goes up into its return to home height that might come into a path of a medevac helicopter or something like that. So not only do you have to know, kind of have a common operating picture for all your systems for quick decision making, you have to know what else is going on in the airspace beyond your sensors themselves. Okay. Uh, Charles, moving over to you as a first responder, um, help us kind of continue this picture of how each stakeholder uh, is is utilizing a common operational picture. How important is the common operational picture for emergency incident response and mitigation? You get a call, you've got a, a DFR response. Talk yeah, about there's that. a lot of different angles here. So one, uh, as was mentioned, basically drones are, are transmitting data. It's either imagery, it's streaming video, or it's <clears throat> or it maybe sensor information from hazmat situation and so on that becomes important. So as you mentioned, drones are first responder. Let's start there. Um, we now launch drones at the time of a 911 call that usually gets on the scene first before the ground law enforcement officers and they have eyes on the scene. Uh, they understand what they're walking into, which first and foremost, it creates a de-escalation tool in most cases because they understand what they're going into, not going in uh, unknowing. Uh, and that's been, we've seen where it saved lives. Uh, we had uh, one fire, uh, vehicle fire where a person was trapped. Uh, the drone got there first, got the correct location, which was critical. And by the time they pulled the person out, the vehicle was fully involved. Uh, we've seen from East Palestine, Ohio, that they used it to assess their train derailment, crash, spill, and fire, <clears throat> which they said would have taken 24 hours longer if they had not had that common operational picture to, to identify what were on the specific train cars. Uh, and then we had uh, the Baltimore bridge collapse, uh, which we're going to have on our uh, public safety drone review next week, uh, who talks about how they use that to assess the situation and start taking action. So the reality is we're able to get in real time a better understanding of what the situation is, what resources that we'll need or what resources we can put back in service and provide information that makes it safer for the responder and the people who may be involved in an incident. Great. Okay, moving on to you, Luke, um, you have a very broad uh, perspective on 
you know, airspace, you come from the French Air Force, you've worked in air traffic management, you're now with Skies working on uh, use based concepts um, in Europe. Could you talk a little bit about the European concept of use space airspace and how that contributes to establishing the common operational picture? Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, I will, I will, I will say, I will explain that with my two hats, which is the first one is the ANSP air service navigation provider from Skies in Belgium, and then I'm also a coordinator of a birdie project which uh, aims to implement use space in Belgium, and um, then maybe what uh, what I have to say about the use space airspace is that definitely it's not to create a common operation uh, picture like it was described for all the uh, all the things but maybe we will discuss about that it's a collateral let me say uh, advantage of the use space airspace maybe first uh, european stakeholders wanted to implement what we called in europe uas geographical zone it was the first step in 2021 to implement an area where you can manage drones when you can uh, impose some uh, constraints regarding equipment, condition to access, and this kind of thing. So not to have a common uh, uh, operation, uh, operational feature, but at least to have a management of the drone activities. So, but of course it was not uh, sufficient in certain locations. So the regulator, the European regulator expressed the need to have uh, something more than that, which is use space. And um, the use space is this UAS geographical zone designated as use space and within this use space you provide services and uh, it's not the uh, ANSP or the the, the 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 air navigation service provider who provides services to drone is really a dedicated service provider and in Europe we call that USSP use space service provider and uh, uh, what is interesting in the services that they provide uh, is that they provide uh, uh, three relevant for me three relevant services in the context of uh, how this uh, webinar is the flight authorization the network uh, identification and the, the traffic information so it means that uh, uh, the drone need to ask for a flight authorization before entering and before operating within an area but it needs to provide also is uh, location, altitude, uh, identification, speed, all these kind of things to the USSP. Uh, and also in return, the USSP needs, uh, not, not needs, but uh, uh, it's mandatory for the USSP to provide services, which is the uh, traffic information against drones, but also against manned traffic, relevant manned traffic. Because use space can be in Europe can be implemented within uncontrolled airspace and control airspace. In control airspace, it's manageable because you have ANSP and then the ANSP and the USSP can um, have a coordination and the integration of drones within a control area is segregation of airspace. I don't go too much in detail on that, but it's segregation of airspace. In uncontrolled, it can be very interesting is that you implement use space and it's up to the man traffic to be econ speakers to be seen by the USSP with a specific uh, system uh, in order to be seen by the uh, by the USSP and the USSP uh, provide this information to the drones uh, and it's up to the drone uh, operator to take action to avoid any risk of collision. So what you have to do to know exactly uh, also is that within the U space airspace you can have several USSPs at the same time. So it's me, it, it, it means that uh, there is a need to have coordination between USSP. But the most important, and this is why I call uh, the, let me say, the collateral advantage of this U uh, space airspace implementation, is that these USSP needs to share. This, the, 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 air, the air situation in the location concerned in the use space designated as use space. And um, uh, the, um, all this concept is uh, um, uh, supported by a high level of automation. So uh, this is what ANRA is really involved in this uh, use space concept. And, uh, and, and voila, the, at the end, 
you will be able within the use based concept to collect the information from the USSP1, from the USSP2, from the USSP3, and then to aggregate all the information and then to provide uh, this common uh, operational uh, picture. Another thing within the European uh, regulation, it is said that this aggregated situation, let me call it like this, uh, shall be provided to uh, authorized user. The list of authorized users is not completely finalized because this is the very first uh, uh, regulation. And if you have experience with regulation, you have a first step and then you have some improvement at the end. Uh, uh, but uh, for the moment, the list is uh, um, very interesting because it's ANSP when it is within control airspace, but it is also police and military which are really uh, involved in uh, counter UAS and uh, enforcement, uh, law enforcement and all these kind of things. But maybe we will come back on that. So in, in a nutshell, what is the, this is what is use space in Europe. So uh, we, thanks to, uh, to use space, we can have in some location when use space is implemented, we can have this common operation picture. What we have to improve as well in the future this is the um, what I call quick reaction operation described uh, by Shao. So um, uh, this is something that we have to improve for the moment. Again, this is the first the first shot for this regulation, and then we will have to improve system procedures in order to cope with uh, quick reaction alert uh, intervention in some uh, catastrophe or something like that. Okay, so that provides us with kind of a perfect segue to going sort of one more level uh, down into this common operational picture. And, uh, you know, we're going to go to, of course, another technology provider. So, Nate, give us sort of a one level down of what data is relevant to this common operational picture. What capabilities are needed to have this effective common operational picture. So, so, you know, as Luke said, it, it's coming from different sources. You have to sort of aggregate data um, to see everything. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we kind of say that there's five key data requirements or five key data sources, but really the focus is to ensure that the data is timely, pertinent to the operation and accurate. So what data or, or what is actually needed uh, for the decision making uh, is is crucial. So when you think of you know something as simple as communications on a team for a specific mission, or you know you can't have that uh, mission become uh, an execution in a silo. Uh, that's just not going to be effective. So there has to be a collaborative and visual representation of real time events. Uh, that's that's the key to the success of a common operational picture. So I'll dive into those those five key data requirements here. First one being timely delivery, so quality of service as well. So that's the capability to, to deliver critical information with a small response time. So how accurate is the feed from the data source? Uh, the next piece is awareness, access, and delivery of information. So as new information, such as pop-up flights, ad hoc, or any unplanned flights may occur, um, you know, perfect example that has already been brought up was an emergency scenario. That's new information. So. The access and delivery mechanism should be done in an automated fashion so as to so as so it is, excuse me, transparent to the end user. The next piece is control of information sources. So now we're talking about the, the decision makers uh, and allowing them the ability to become aware of new information that we just discussed and access it with ease. So it is necessary to accomplish what is needed for command and control of that scenario. Uh, what's needed there is a geographical interface that allows the users to have a single point of access uh, to the variety of information. Uh, and then the last two here, uh, common protocols and representations for exchanging information. So this gets into a little bit of the regulatory side of things that we'll, we'll maybe touch on here. Uh, but the users and regulators, uh, I'll just say the FAA, when we talk about the regulators in this instance, they need, to, they need to agree on this common representation uh, so that the seamless communication can occur between systems. So what and how the data sources are deemed safe 
and compliant with current or future standards. Uh, and then lastly is the synchronization and scalability of information sources. So just plain and simple, ensuring all the data feeds are, are fully integrated and talking to one another. Uh, and then from the scalability standpoint, um, you know, finding the appropriate technology to integrate uh, that is also viable from an economic and use case perspective. Okay, so when we talk about all of the data that's necessary for this common operational picture. You know, Tom, I, I want to go to you and talk about um, kind of the similarities and the differences between, uh, you know, that data that's necessary for airspace awareness and the data that's necessary for airspace security, right? Are we talking about the same thing? Is this, is, is this a, a one product that actually meets the needs of these different stakeholders? Yeah, and what's interesting is, you know, a lot of the same tools that you would might use to provide airspace awareness for beyond visual line of sight or any other drone related type mission or some of the same tools that we would want to use in a security mission. We want to understand what's going on in the airspace. We might have cameras, radars, uh, we might have uh, radio frequency detection equipment, and maybe there's acoustic systems that are involved. All that information gives us information about you know drones that may be in the airspace but as has been mentioned before if i'm operating near a, a maritime environment i, I want to know where some of the boats are because drones often launch from boats and i want to know other drone traffic in the area or crude aircraft air traffic in the area so that i can have a full assessment of what's going on but what's interesting is we're all using the same types of tools but maybe just for different missions but on the security side i absolutely have to know what's going on with the crude and uncrewed aircraft traffic in order to make uh, a threat assessment and to respond properly without increasing risk to the national airspace, the uh, communication spectrum and the critical assets and infrastructure that we're trying to protect. So it's we're, we're all we're all trying to do the same thing, but maybe for different reasons. And it's going to be interesting to see how this evolves to because data is data is really the new gold, right? And so, so that we've got a lot of different people that are providing this information. How do you make it all come together and work? And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch evolve over the, over the next few years. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I'm going to go Peter next and then Charles, Peter, how does a common operational picture impact your everyday missions at NYPA? I mean, and you are sort of boots on the ground serving your customers and your community with drones. So. Look, New York power authority, we own ever, we have a lot of assets from Niagara falls to the St. Lawrence river, all the way down to the city. Okay, and we want to operate when we have to operate. Um, this year is going to be a dry summer. Everyone's telling us, so we'll be up and down this line. But yet again, the outside forces will be flying as well, detecting and knowing. I can tell you where any one of my pilots are in any given point in time, because we use Enra. When we start talking about outside entities. You know, where is that hobbyist flying? Where is that land surveyor flying? Where is security doing their border patrol operating? Understanding where the others are is a necessity and it's a struggle because we see what's going on overseas with this same type of tools we're using. And my organization doesn't want to be the first one that something might happen to. And you don't want to be the first one. And and the fear is really there. Having having a system that can help detect, hey, that is okay. That mission over there, we don't know what's going on with it. No remote ID, no a variety of different things. That's when that threat assessment comes into play. Okay. Um, Niagara Falls is one of the most flown locations in New York State. And a lot of our assets are right there. And every time a drone goes up, we get the alerts that they're happening. And it's like, okay, get your drones down. That midair, they, we know where we are. We know where they are. They don't know where we are. And they fly for fun. It's quite scary. Um, fun, 
but scary. <laughs> I hear you. Um, Charles, when we're talking about uh, an emergency response, right? So maybe you weren't in the air two minutes ago, but now you need to get a, an SGI waiver or you need to um, launch very quickly. How do you become part of that common operational picture? How, how do first responders sort of participate? Yeah, I think it's um, it's it's been repeated over and over again. It's really about knowing the airspace awareness is what's happening in the space that we are either in or that we're about to go into. And uh, it's very complex. And right now, there really is no easy way to identify who all is in the space uh, because we have uh, it, it, we have remote ID, which is probably the most uh, unreliable method of determining what's in the airspace. But we have to be able to get up at a moment's notice and be able to fly, and that somehow needs to be communicated to the larger community that we are now flying in their space. And not, and oftentimes it's not it's not the opportunity to get a TFR to block it. Uh, and when we have a TFR, uh, we still have to be able to identify cooperatives from uncooperatives when we're operating in the space to know what's happening. But I give you an example of how complex emergency incidents get very quickly. Uh, if you can imagine any of these major incidents that occur, whether it's a wildfire or it's a hazmat situation or it's the bridge collapse or whatever it might be, uh, or for example, uh, Columbia University uh, being overrun. Uh, if you read the news, NYPD was using that to help do assessments last night. Um, but what happens with that is suddenly we have multiple local agencies with drones. We have state agencies that come in with drones. We have federal agencies that come in with drones. We have media. They come in with drones, and then we have the people that are the curious and and just want to see what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, we we also have that criminal element that comes in and may play a role in some of these things. So it, very, it gets complicated very quickly. So the evolution of getting to some type of network that allows us the, the comms to communicate in real time, so that we have an assessment of where we are, is going to be really critical for the future of uh, our effectiveness and our safety. Luke. Over to you on how Europe is sort of thinking about this issue of compliance and non-compliance. You know, the use space concept, um, as you have said, is based on collaboration of drones in compliance with EU regulations. So what, how is the use space community thinking about what to do about non-compliant drones? Because, you know, they're there whether it's uh, for nefarious purpose or simply um, through ignorance. Yeah, you're fully right because the use space airspace is based on the fact that all drones are compliant. So it means that even if we try to cope, for instance, uh, emergency and so on, everything is compliant. All drones operator are compliant. However, the use space can be also implemented due to security uh, issue. Uh, and if they have a non-compliant drones, it's true that the, the use space is not developed for that. So it means that we will have to, in the future, uh, and we already think about, this is why in the Birdie project that I talked about a few minutes ago, we have military and we have police as well, in order to think about, to learn how to use use space, how to take advantage of the use space in order to, to deal with this non-compliant. And then, one of the first, um, uh, let me say, direction that we see is that we have to complement the use space disposal with a uh, uh, drone detection system. It can be optical, it can be radar, it can be sound, so like, uh, like it was already said. But most probably we will have to complement if we want to uh, uh, deal with non-compliant and especially close to the critical infrastructure, uh, like airports. And then I took my, my hat as an ANSP. And then really close to the airport, most probably in the future, we will have to, uh, uh, to complement the use space uh, system with uh, a, a, a detection, a system of detection for drones. Um, the, uh, what I want to, to, to say as well is that within the use space airspace, we already have, um, let me say, um, a, a point to distribute data, which is a common information service provider. 
I talked about the USSP, your space service provided, providing services to the, to the drones. But for that data, like it was said, the data is really the gold for the future. And then the data is really important for this common operational uh, feature, but also for all the rest. And then we have in the use space concept, a common information service provider uh, notion. And then in Europe, we, uh, let me say, this is, this is um, uh, um, the, the, the most, the, the, the uh, big number of, uh, of uh, state go for having a single CISP because you, have, you can have in one area, you can have one CISP in another area, one, another CISP. But a lot of state goes for one single uh, common service uh, uh, information provider in order to ensure that all the, the, the sources, all the data uh, will come from one reliable source because the common information, the common operational feature, for instance, is really important to have a, a, a reliable uh, data origin. So it's very important. So, um, if I continue to the uh, the complement of the use space and the drone detection, uh, as it was said by uh, uh, by uh, by Tom, we can do different things. We can do, and especially for an NSP, we we can do safety. We can solve safety issue, but we are not allowed to solve to solve security issue. However, we can contribute to this security issue providing data, for instance. And then this is why at a certain moment close to the, the critical infrastructure, which is the, the airport, we will have to exchange with the airport itself, with military, with uh, police, uh, uh, a common feature in order to have to determine what will be the, 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 the role of the police, what will be the role of the military, what will be the role of the airport, what will be the role of the ANSP, and not to be contradictory and to be complementary, complementary uh, and uh, this is something that we that we start to develop in Belgium for the moment. In France, it was developed since years now, uh, but it's it's still improving. But this is really something that we have to to work on uh, as well, because counter UAS is really something different than uh, only having the common operational picture. But it's another subject, maybe. But uh, we have to detect, evaluate the threat, and then to neutralize if the threat is uh, uh, assessed as really uh, high. So, but it's, it's, it's something different, but the common operational feature is really, I believe is really the, the first stone, the cornerstone of uh, counter UAS for the future. Okay, so different than counter UAS systems, but definitely co complementary and necessary to them um, to see everything. Tom, would you agree with that, that, that while a counter UAS uh, picture of the airspace is different than a common operating picture. They're definitely complementary and, and essential to each other. Absolutely. Different missions, a lot of the same information. Uh, they may just be viewing it in a different light, but absolutely the complementary uh, for sure. And let's talk just a minute and please um, other panelists, just uh, lift your hand if you want to jump in on anything. Um, I uh, don't don't want to prevent any of that to our participants. Um, we will open up for questions uh, at 1045. So please uh, do that's Eastern time on the 45. Uh, there will be the question and answer uh, box in the corner of your screen. Charles, I didn't even ask a question yet. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that just so you know that we can't raise our hands through the Program, oh, right, but, program. but you could do it visually. I'll see. Okay. I'll see the visual. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. So. Tom, let's. Let's address this. Let's just talk about this for a 2nd remote ID. So remote ID, um, in the US, of course, has just been, um. Put into place, uh, that's an example of a technology that what that is, uh. You know, it can provide airspace awareness uh, for a common operating picture, uh, you know, within a limited range. Uh, is remote ID a replacement for drone detection technology? 
Yeah, thanks, Miriam. So remote ID is not a replacement for drone technology. It, it can add or supplement that. I think what's one thing that's important to note about remote ID is that uh, there's been a, a, a misunderstanding about what remote ID is actually telling you. Um, there's I've been involved in discussions where people say, well, if they're not broadcasting remote ID, then the drone automatically has to be assessed as a threat and dealt with appropriately. And, and my response has always been, well, how do you know it's not broadcasting remote ID? You might not just may not be receiving it. Uh, maybe the drone doesn't have to broadcast remote ID message elements because not every drone has to broadcast remote ID. And so you kind of have to take a step back and understand, you know, what it is telling you. And then the other thing it's not telling you. It's not telling you whether the drone is or is not a threat. And if you are receiving message elements, it doesn't tell you whether the drone is compliant with other FA uh, airspace rules and regulations or regulatory rules and regulations. So you just have to treat it as one data point of many that you have to look at it, but it's not the data point. It's just other information that you should look at. So just because they're broadcasting remote ID and you're getting those message elements doesn't mean you now ignore it. It could be on a nefarious mission and you still have to monitor what's going on in the airspace. So it's just a data point. It's a great tool to have um, to have a provider space awareness, but it's also important to keep in mind that maybe those remote ID message elements have been spoofed. So you really just have to peel it all back and just take it all in, but not use it as your main source for your threat assessment, uh, uh, you know, as part of your space awareness. And Peter, as a, as a, um, you know, commercial user, uh, other than having to, of course, be compliant, um, with the laws has, has remote ID implementation changed, uh, your mission planning or, or work at all. It, 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 it's changed what systems we use. Okay, as an organization, I'm not going to have my guys or my pilots charge a module, a drone, a battery and all their equipment and, and worry about a module. So we're updating our systems to be compliant. But where, where the real ramifications, I think New York Power Authority will see this and we see it now is at each of our sites. We work closely with some of the AMA fields nearby. And if you're on an AMA field, it's not mandatory to have that. And so getting the understanding of guys, people, we know they're operating here. We know they're flying patterns. They're flying multi-rotors. We help this field. They are not a threat. It's being used right now as it's no remote ID. It must be bad. And in understanding that, there are these special use cases where it's not mandated. Um, and it, as the airspace becomes more and more congested, did our sensor even pick it up? Do we need more remote ID sensors to pick them up? Do we need better triangulation with these? It's, it's, it's a, it's a catch 22. Great. Everyone has remote ID, but just because they don't have remote ID just means it's our sensor in the most optimal place set place. Those are real problems that now we're going to have to face. <laughs> okay, that's something I, I hadn't thought about. That's very interesting to think about that just because someone doesn't have remote ID doesn't mean Charles. I just wanted to add that we've also heard from the FA that there's only 25% compliance with remote ID. Okay, so that's an additional <laughs> complication to Peter's point that you can't just make any assumption about um, a remote ID signal that you can't see. <laughs> uh, Nate, do you want to contribute to that, or are you? What are your thoughts on on remote ID as a piece of the picture? No, I, I think everybody hit it. I, I think Tom has has one more loaded here. Yeah, I was just going to say with with remote ID. Um, you know, I think the ranges of these remote ID broadcasts might vary from system to system. And the other thing to keep in mind is that terrain and other RF interference might impact being able to receive that signal. So that's why I kind of made the point earlier is that they might be broadcasting, but you're just not receiving the signal either due to range, RF interference, terrain, those types of things. And so that's why, again, going back to why you can't just do your threat assessment based on receiving or not receiving remote ID. Remote ID data is just one data element that you need to consider. 
Okay, so one part of the picture, definitely not a replacement for uh, anything else, just an additional piece of piece of information. Correct. Yeah. Charles, I want to go back um, to you for a minute, just because I really think that, um, you know, drones in emergency response are emerging as a uh, as a significant sector of of you know people in the airspace, and also when you think about um, simply the nature of the work that first responders are doing, they will often uh, take priority over other missions. So, you know, a food delivery mission, for example, might have to make way for uh, a, you know, first responder mission. So when you're thinking about how your constituents are using drones are beginning um, on these on these projects, uh, you know, how do you see sort of the deconfliction aspect working out? Well, it was interesting at our conference in March, the, the uh, NASA was asking specifically on UTM, what does that mean for public safety when you're doing these responses? It also goes back to the, the radio spectrum FCC questions that were being asked when they were saying, can you sign up for a specific time that you want to respond? And can you give me an allotment of how long it's going to be? Well, no, it doesn't work that way. We've got to have it when we start. We've got to have it until we're finished and then we'll we'll lead the airspace. But to your point, as we let's use DFR as the greatest example, because you're trans you're transferring from one location to another, and you're going to be crossing all the airspace at a moment's notice. So what I said to the the and NASA was, uh, I'll oversimplify this. What I need is the communications that can allow the the networking of all those operating airspace to to clear out, just like we do on the ground. So as we're on the ground, we have our red lights and our sirens, and it identifies us, and they know to pull over, and we drive around as best we can. With the airspace, we have a little more flexibility in directions we can go. We can go left or right, up and down. So, but the key is the common operational picture is the basis of being able to have that maneuvering capability so that other units know we're coming or that we can get around them. Uh, and, and so we have priority access. And, and I think that's going to be the critical element. We also heard from law enforcement that said we need, we sometimes may have missions that are we don't want to be on the radar so, so to speak so we need to have that space being communicated not necessarily identifying who we are or what we're doing but that airspace is occupied at the time so there are a number of different elements but everything that we're talking about here with the com operation picture and the awareness in the airspace is leading us to what's coming next so it's the deliveries and it's it's also moving toward advanced air mobility everything that we're doing is is a key to what what's coming to the future especially for public safety Luke, Luke, please. Uh, yes, uh, I, I just want to jump on the on the last uh, the last uh, speech of, of Charlie because my military past, my military past, and it's true that sometimes when you have some uh, police operation, when you have military operation, you don't want to be seen, or at least you. But but at least you need to be safe, and then to ensure the safety for you and for the other users. And this is also in Europe. The, something that we try to to integrate and uh, this is why again that in the project the birdie project we have military and and police in order to to cope with that and um, what we we had different different approach for that um we can do uh, uh, let me say a very um uh, simple things a kind of reservation of some predefined corridors or something and then but it's very fixed very uh, uh it's frozen so it's a frozen solution. So it's not really uh, uh, adequate. But what we probably in the future and uh, um, what we will be able to do is to use the automation of the use space airspace in order to be more flexible, more reactive. And then because of the automation of the development of the system, we will be able to have a certain delay for the 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 the, the, the quick reaction or the uh, uh, the taking the takeoff in emergency. In order just to change the flight authorization of other users, for instance, but for that we will need to have technology available, which is not the case, at least as my knowledge, uh, it is not the case for the moment. But maybe this is something that we have to think about. Charles, do you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to add. I think that as we move forward, we're going to have. It's not going to be one system. And I think Luke hit on this. It's going to be a system of systems as we migrate into this. Because we're going to have to take all these different aspects to plug it in to be able to understand it. 
Um, some of it's going to be networked. Some of it's going to be vehicle to vehicle. Some of it's going to be remote ID. So it's taking all this information and really, and I think Luke had done this earlier is we're going to have to have this aggregated data come in in some form of source management and communication to make sure it's it's the right information that the people are supposed to be transmitting information and it's reliable so that we can actually be moving safely and feel confident in the network that's operating. So definitely is going to require the cooperation of all cooperative uh, airspace participants. So Q&A is now open um, for everybody. Please put in your questions. Um, a couple of them have already come up. Uh, the first one is directed uh, at you, Nate, which is how does ONRA hope to integrate a consolidated network of public DAA, that's detect and avoid, sensors with private operators' own ground-based DAA sensors? Will ONRA Fusion accommodate a public and private partnership? So if somebody has their own sensors, uh, is is that a possibility yeah, absolutely uh, from our standpoint we are sensor uh, agnostic uh, from whatever hardware that uh, the end user would like to use I think the biggest thing there is in taking into all the end users is the privacy of the data who needs to see it uh, taking a DFR standpoint uh, if there is a launch uh, is there a way to make that information just available to the responders themselves and not necessarily to the public. So I think it gets a little bit more into the data privacy, data security from the integration standpoint or the data that is being gathered. And then what is the data that is being pumped out to the general population, to the civilian community? Um, I think that's more of the discussion rather than just if we can integrate with the, those pieces of hardware, because we certainly can. We have uh, and we are currently doing that today on an operational level. So, um, yeah, more of the data privacy and, and what what is going to be shared. Uh, I think that that discussion needs to happen and is happening, but um, a little bit more guardrails need to be put in place. Okay, thank you. Um, we have uh, several other questions coming in here. So, uh, here's a question about remote ID. As we, as we know, um, you know, the end rule on remote ID uh, decided on a particular approach in the U.S. This question says, would an FAA mandated step up to network remote ID as opposed to broadcast enable increased conspic conspicuity, excuse me, of UAS in densely populated environments. Could this be the standardized traffic source for deconfliction? Anyone want to go there or <laughs> voice an opinion on that? So for me, it would actually be quite difficult to do a network solution. Okay. Right now we have some not um, we have some problems in some portions of the state where the nearest cell tower, the nearest network availability is not available. Uh, uh, uh. Now, does that mean I have to go buy sat phones for every single mission that goes forward? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'd be a little bit scared of, of doing it like that. Uh, I don't know what a correct solution of a remote ID is. Uh, that's why I'm not part of the FAA and trying to write the rules. Charles. You know, I think that's that's the point is that if we're going to be doing this airspace thing, we're going to have to have other sensors in place that start creating to uh, to be across all the areas to where we're going to fly. If networking is going to be an option, it's going to have to be something that's a system of systems again. So just a, a cellular network and ground terrestrial systems as we know them today are not going to be enough. And even if you had network, you still have the issue of compliance. Uh, as far as people doing that. So, you know, one of the things we have trouble with as far as how can the FAA reinforce those types of rules. All right, go ahead, Nate. Yeah, just before we leave that, just thinking of traditional airspace, I mean, or air traffic control, even if you know where somebody is, what are the procedures? What are the communications? How are they gonna know what the actions are of a participating aircraft if you can't talk to that pilot? Um, if there's lost comms procedures. So 
just kind of throwing that out there as far as just because you know where somebody is, if you're not in direct communication with them, uh, either verbally or by some sort of chat mechanism, uh, then you still may not know what their actions are going to be. Okay. Our next question comes in for Luke. Luke, how do you see both continents tackling UTM, ATM? Are they working together and working independently? How's the cooperation working? If we talk about UTM, ATM in control airspace, they will, uh, the, the use space regulation put in place a, a system, as I said, uh, based on segregation of activities however, and segregation of airspace. However, uh, the regulation introduced uh, uh, a new notion, or a new notion, officialized, let me say, a notion, which is the dynamic airspace reconfiguration. So it means that depending of the demands on man aircraft, depending of the demands of unmanned aircraft, the, the structure of the use space airspace could be subdivided in different pieces and then open to drones, close to drones, open to man aircraft, and uh, close to man aircraft. So this is what we call dynamic airspace reconfiguration. Of course, because this is the the, the new regulation, uh, a new regulation. We we want to limit the the, the dynamicity at the at the at, as a first step. But in the future, again, thanks to technology, I believe that thanks to technology, uh, procedures to be implemented and so on between. Uh, drone operator, USSP and ANSP, we will be more dynamic and more flexible. So the end, the objective of the uh, of the, the the European regulator and the use space is to be fully integrated. When I don't know, <laughs> and I believe that no one knows, <laughs> but at least this is the end, the the aim of this uh, regulation. The use space is not. Uh, the, the, the destiny of the use space is not to stay as it is right now. So it is really to evolve to a full integration. And uh, um, maybe I will, but I will talk about that maybe at the end of the, 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 the future. We have to consider the development of the UTM right now for the future ATM. But maybe I will talk about that in the, at the end. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes in for Peter. Can uh, NIPA expand on how they use crewed and uncrewed aircraft and deconflict? Do they use a COP? Do they need a COP? Yeah, we're we're building out something like a COP now. For uh, for manned aviation, we have helicopters, we have airplanes, and we have helicopter contractors that come on site to do their their missions. We're starting to mandate an AD, ADSB uh, transponders to be on these systems, but yet again, ADSB isn't mandated on every single aircraft that's out there. So, especially in a big portion of the state, we have crop dusters and other small aircraft that do not have ADSB. So, that's half a picture. Yet again, this is going to go to Lucas's point of its multiple solutions in one: remote ID detection counter UAS detection on radio frequency only, because yet again, there's a little bit of a gray zone for private entities and what we are allowed to do moving forward. So this is a multitude of things that we build out to, to, to sort of get us there. Um, is it perfect? No. Do we still have gaps? Yes. Are we trying to solve the gaps slowly, consistently? We, we are improving every day. It's just there's 25% of users are uh, only 25% of users are on remote ID. A good portion of airports, uh, please look up New York State airports. There are hundreds of private and public airports all across the state. A lot of the private airports do not use ADSB. How do we de deconflict when over this transmission line when you have crop dusters, helicopters, and everything? So I can see where our contractors are. I can see where our aircraft are, and I know where our pilots are, but that's not even half the problem. So this, this last question is uh, a huge question. We, we only have a couple of minutes here, but um, how can we create a perfect system that handles 
all the data we need, works well with other systems, and helps us make quick and effective decisions about keeping infrastructure safe and secure. I mean, this is, I guess this is right for you, Nate, as a, as a technology provider, but I think it speaks to sort of everybody's um, broader uh, points this morning that uh, collaboration is key. This is, this is not, no one person can make this happen. Nate, you want to, you want to go first? Exactly. Yeah, collaboration is key, and, and it ultimately, you know, we've always pushed for a federated system where it's going to be. It said before on this talk, system of systems. Uh, we really need the collaboration uh, effort of the regulators. Those things are happening right now to test out these um, available technologies to make sure that everything is safe uh, when we integrate into the national airspace. So. More of those efforts uh, in different environments, so testing throughout the United States, but also taking a page of what, you know, the European Union is doing, EASA, some of the other regulatory bodies across the globe as well. Um, personally, I, you know, the FAA may be just falling behind just a little bit <clears throat> where we could take some of those uh, use cases or, or tests that have been evaluated. Uh, you know, take a page out of that book and, and bring it here to the states. But I, I think it's certainly going to be a federated system. It's not a one all, uh, <clears throat> one technology take all. So, collaboration. Luke and Charles also, also wanted to say something there. Um, um, not from a technological point of view, Kyoki, I mean, but uh, I believe also that. Uh, uh, standardization, harmonization, interoperability will be very important, and not only in Europe, not only in uh, in US and uh, in some other con uh, uh, continent, for instance. And we have in Europe, I, I was part of that. We have some contact with the FAA and the NASA in order to exchange on the how we implement UTM in Europe, in USA, um, and and the, the the standardization between all the actors all around the world uh, uh, about that. It's really important, I believe. Charles? Yeah, I'll just add, yeah, I'll just add, I think from a public safety standpoint, it's really important to understand that whatever that we use that's required to be communicating in this network, it has to be affordable for public safety. Uh, that's one of the things that is often forgotten is that we get asked afterwards and there's requirements and there's no funding for us to fall into that. So. Absolutely, and that's probably true for everyone. If you want everybody to comply, it has to be uh, affordable. So, um, okay, we need to wrap up here. Uh, this has been a terrific panel. Thank you all so much for your expertise. I'm always uh, honored to be part of this conversation. As we end, let me just go around the panel uh, quickly to ask for your sort of aspirational view of of the drone industry at scale. How do you think, what do you think this is going to look like 10 to 15 uh, years from now? This is one of my favorite questions because everybody sees it a little bit differently. I'm going to start with as my screen uh, goes, Tom, you first. Uh, it's a lot of pressure to kick this off. I, I think one of the things that I'm looking at and interested in is watching how drones navigate through the airspace because to me that really plays to the types of tools that you deploy as part of a security mission or potentially as an airspace awareness mission. So, you know, we start to see drones move away from traditional RF control to where they're using other methods and modalities to navigate through the airspace with onboard sensors and there's less reliance on communication. I think that's going to be really interesting and I'll be watching that. Peter. Well, in a perfect world, it would just work. But that's really not going to, I foresee if someone PD is flying, police departments are flying, fire departments are flying, NIPA is flying, we would know where they are. Where the hobbyist is flying, I would know where they are. And hopefully we say, hey, NIPA, you got zero to 215 feet. Everyone else can fly above you and we can start to, that would be option perfect, but <laughs> Perfect doesn't work. <laughs> Something to hope for. Nate, what do you think? So I think automation is key here. Um, kind of go out on a limb. But uh, if you look at your traditional air traffic control, there's um, there's employment uh, that's not reaching where they need it to be as far as air traffic controllers. There's also a pilot shortage as well, traditional manned aircraft. 
So where drones are going, I believe, is is automation, and, and that automation is needed and needs to be certified as well. So I see a little bit more of, of automation coming into play here. Yeah. For me, what I see in 10 or 15 years is uh, really the development of drones used for public and terrorist mission operations, like it was said. So police, uh, military surveillance, uh, fire brigade, and this kind of things, medical support, um, of course, but also the um, for what we call in Europe, advanced mobility, which is the, for instance, um, uh, how to reach uh, some uh, uh, very isolated, um, um, uh, which is difficult to reach some uh, countryside or something, something like that, to deliver some uh, essential goods or something like that. When you don't have a lot of roads and something, this is really what I call public interest, and it's not to deliver coffee or something. Uh, maybe in the future, but first, I believe if we want, because the social acceptance is very also uh, important, and then if we want to make that acceptable, I believe that we have to go for interest, the public interest, and and um, um, jumping it. What I said just a few minutes ago, I believe also that the ATM will be. Um, deeply modified by the entry of this new uh, uh, comer, which is the uh, UTM or the drones, and especially the uh, technology used by drone management uh, in Europe, use space. And I believe that ATM will uh, be really impacted by that. A lot of automation, a lot of uh, system to support the operation, and even for ATM. And this is really the, the, the path for the integration of UTM, ATM, as I talked about a few seconds ago. Thank you. All right, Chief, wrap it up for us. Yeah, this is going to be really short. Uh, basically, automation is absolutely important. I think we're going to see a lot of the artificial intelligence starting to come into play of helping to, to see these anomalies and understand it. Um, but I also think that it's going to give us an opportunity for uh, uh, integrating the multimodal uh, perspectives of this, because what we want to do is be able to replace some things with other things so that we don't just move 1 problem from 1 place to another. And so I think that's going to create opportunities from ground transportation of medical patients to air transportation, which makes the most sense and the same thing with wildfires and other stuff. So I think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come uh, and it's going to be an exciting time to be in the space. All right, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, that is the end of our time. This has been a great panel. Thank you very much to all of our illustrious participants. Um, again, honored to uh, moderate this panel with you. Hope to see you at the next Honor Huddle. Thank you. 